will rejoice and be glad in it. Beloved, I'm so delighted to be here celebrating with you and my friend for your 120th uh, anniversary, church anniversary. For that we say to God be the glory, great things he has done. Uh, let me rush to say how uh, honored I am to be here and to always be with the people of Mount Tabor, all of the officers and members and friends. Good to always see you and I certainly am always blessed. My brother, experiencing your ministry of music, I love your, the ministry of music that you give to us. We thank God for your heart always, always. Let me invite your attention today to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We commence at verse number 12. And if you will, let me read a, a portion of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse number 12. I'm reading from the King James Version. For as the body is one and have many members, and all the members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Verse number 20. But now are there they many members, yet one body. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Let me tag this text in this message today, the church that God is building, Amen. the church that God is building. I was looking at a page on the internet a few months back called mymove.com and they compiled a list of 10 of the greatest modern architects in our time. Hmm. They considered them to be iconic legends. Among these names was Frank Gehry or F Frank Lloyd Wright and Yoing Ming Pei and Zaha Hadid, just to name a few. They were all considered by their peers as being among the greatest architects and builders on the planet, particularly in the 20th century. Yet the greatest architect and building in the universe was not on that list. This architect, this builder is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He pledged to build his church. He not only built his church in times past, he continues to build his church. But a question arises in my mind as I pondered that. What is this church like? And what is it to be about? A man was walking down by a building one day and saw three stone masons side by side, sweating over their work in the sun. He asked the first, what are you doing? Laying bricks came the reply. He asked the second stone mason, what are you doing? He said, building a wall came that reply. Then he asked the third mason, and what are you doing? He said, I am raising a cathedral. Same building, but different 
perspectives. This is often true concerning the church. Sometimes there are thoughts or ideas or attitudes and actions in which people engage that are diametrically opposed to the church that Christ is building. There are times when we even speak of the church. We give in our speech and, our, and as we speak of going to church, which when we're referring to attending the worship service or the events in the building, sometimes we say we had church or let's have church when referring to an ecstatic or fervent worship experience. No doubt most people like me, I've used these terms. When we use them, we're not attempting to communicate wrong impressions about the church. Yet the unintended result is that many people may be left confused by its uses. It may have the unfortunate consequence of moving us away from the church that Jesus is building. Yes. Among others, the church is often viewed as an organization we join, pay membership dues, attend periodically and receive membership benefits like the use of the church building for weddings and funerals and family functions. And this too is potentially a problem if that is the extent of our understanding. In our text today, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church of Corinth gives us a glimpse of the kind of church that God is designing because although ultimately he will build his church sometimes in the interim, we can frustrate God's purposes in the building of his church. And through the explanations found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 12 and 4 following, we understand more about the kind of church that God has built. And notice, first of all, in verse 12, God's depiction of his church. The Bible says, for as the body is one and have many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Many, but one. Yes, sir. Diversity, but still unity. Yes, sir. Notice this picture. It's a body. Notice that analogy, this metaphor, if you will. It's a body. And may I say here that, do you notice that there's no separation of the head from the body? Because there are so many who will dare be a part of a church who thinks that they can have a relationship with the head but have none with the body. Come on. Our physical bodies are made up of many systems that carry out various functions. We have the intercommentary, we have the skeletal, the muscular, the nervous, the in endocrine, the cardiovascular, the lymphatic, the respiratory, the digestive, the urinary, and the reproductive. And like the physical body, Christ's body is made up of various systems and parts, each performing the functions for which they were designed and then working together. God is working for a healthy, functioning body. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, the problem in Christ's body, the church, is that there are parts trying to function in ways for which they were never designed. That's the question that begs to be answered today. Are you functioning in the way which Christ has designed or placed you? Or have you placed yourself in an area for which God did not design? I want you to see this. Your purpose and mine in the body is to function in the way that God has designed you. And not only that, that picture gives us a sense that we ought to work with other parts and other systems. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. 
I'm gonna mess with that in a minute, but I, I, I sometimes we are we are not willing to work with others except those who are in our cliques or those who are part of our tribe, those who are part of the things that we're up to. Sometimes we come and we have our own selfish agendas that go contrary to what God is trying to design. Amen. But we are to work with other parts and other systems. This is God's depiction. And I want you to notice in this text, verse 13 through 24, not only God's depiction, notice God's design. He has a process. He has a means. Verse 13 says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. The believer is placed in this body by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit is that inside work that occurs at the point of conversion. We assume that when we come to this body that we are converted. Notice you can be placed in the the universal church at conversion, but you can join a local church and never been born again. My Lord. We make the assumption that just because a name is on the roll, that we've had a transformative experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Spirit's work within you and me that unites us to the body of Christ. Water baptism is the outward symbol of this inward reality. The believer is baptized by the spirit. That's on the inside. And then we are baptized in the water. This shows on the outside what is supposed to have occurred already on the inside. But many times people will join the local church who have not been born again and that cause a problem. But God puts us into the body of Christ after the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God the Father is God without skin. God the Son is God with skin. God the Holy Spirit is God in your skin. God the Father is God above us. God the Son is God with us. God the Holy Spirit is God within us. You must be born again. Come on, Reverend. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 tells them after Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They said, you've got to repent and be baptized. Do you notice the order? You've got to change your ways and turn from your sins and turn to God and then be baptized as an identification with Christ. You are made of the disciple and then you are marked as a disciple and then you are matured as God's disciple. He says, this is God's design. God places the believer in the body by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That means the walls of racism and ethnicity and class and economic status, educational social standing, does not have anything to do with your placement in the body. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit <laughs> places the believer into the body despite these categories. Uh, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden these categories are erased. It just means that the Holy Spirit's work of salvation does not depend on these categories. Sometimes we join the local church and we'll put people in positions based on their economic, educational, and social status. But God is not concerned about that. You don't get in and you don't get any favors because of that. You get it because you're in right relationship with God and you are in right relationship with the Holy Spirit. And that puts you in right relationship with your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. My Lord, Reverend, my Lord. There's diversity but there's still got to be some unity. Amen. Notice I said unity and not uniformity. Amen. Verse 14 says the body is not one member, but many members. Lord, have mercy. And just because, notice the text, you are not another part 
or don't function in another way doesn't change the fact that you are still a part of the body. Paul says in verse 15, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Just because you're not a, another part or doesn't function in another way, let me say it again, doesn't change the fact that you are still a part of the body. Maybe people are upset about that. Maybe they're complaining because he created you the way you are and he decided what part you are. Notice the text says in verse 15, if the foot shall say, Lord have mercy, that, that, that because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. I don't know what you missed this text because verse 18 says that God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And when we complain because we are not a part of the body that we want to be, that is an affront on the Holy Spirit because he made you the way you are. God knows that even before you were in your mother's womb, he had called you. He knew your height, your weight, your skin color, the, the, the shape of your nose and the, the color of your hair and the color of your eyes, then sometimes we complain against the sovereignty of God in our placement in the body. Everybody can't be the head. My Lord. He says, because you are the foot, the lowest part of the body, doesn't mean that you don't have a purpose that some other parts don't have. Because the foot has a purpose that the hand can't fulfill. Amen. And maybe the foot is jealous because the gift of others may be more visible. Good God Almighty Jesus. These parts, the Bible says in verse 22, that we consider to be weak, that are not as spectacular or not visible, are absolutely necessary because people are not speaking in tongues or displaying what you would consider to be powerful gifts does not mean that they are not necessary. Amen. Good God Almighty. Just because you don't see your lungs and hearts doesn't mean that it's not necessary. I may not see my heart beating, but it's so sure necessary. Verse 23 says, the parts that we consider to be less honorable or unpresentable, we bestow greater honor and they have greater modesty. What Paul is saying is that those so-called unpresentable parts are more abundantly cared for by being carefully covered with clothes. Unlike your face or your Hands which are uncovered. Notice the text again. He says in verse 23, he says, the members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Because we put more care in it. Come on. Because you think it's not as great doesn't mean that it doesn't have a purpose. Because you think it's not as honorable or beautiful does not mean that it does not have a function in God's body. It's that, 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 that's not what God is concerned about. Paul says in this text that God has this design because God has a desire. Notice verse 25. The desire is that there should be no schism in the body. There should be no division. There should not be any odds. People at odds with each other. In other words, we're not lifting one gift above another gift. Amen. There are no cliques in the body. There are no separation. There's no income cliques. No education clicks. No fraternity and sorority clicks. No tenure clicks. No talent clicks. No training clicks or treasures. That does not make you more important. 
Yes, sir. And the body doesn't matter about your tenure, how long you've been at the church. Amen. The body doesn't matter about your training, what kind of degrees you got. You can have a PhD, but what you really need is GOD. You can have a BA, but, but, but you need to be born again. He's not concerned about how much money you have in the bank or how much talent you have or how long you've been in the church. He purpose is that we are being united despite the diversity so that there'll be no big eyes and little use. Do your part, your duty, Amen. your function in your own place and don't murmur or quarrel with others. You got to know your place. You got to get in your place. Function in your place. I've been print pastor now, restoring grace for about 18 years, and I've come to some conclusions. I've been in church all my life. My daddy was a pastor. Great grandfather was grandfather was my great grandfather, and I've been around church long enough to see sometimes that some of the problems that we have as, is that we uh, have people who are not staying in their place. They don't know how to stay in their lanes and Consequently, we work against the church that God is building. My Lord. He says, do your part, do your duty, function in your own place. Don't murmur. We can't try to be the pastor. You only got one pastor. Uh, deacons have to function as deacons. That's the diaconal ministry. They are servants and trustees have to function that serve that we have to have ushers function in there and members functioning according to their gifts. If your gift is to encourage, then encourage. Stay in your lane. If your gift is to give, give and to be a person of faith, then give and be a person of faith. The, the hand needs to function as the hand and the foot as the foot and the heart as the heart. Stay in your lane. No member ought to be murmuring and quarreling with others in the body. Jeez. I'll not be at odds with each other like that. No member in the body, no matter how feeble or illiterate or obscure or educated or financed, should be despised or regarded as unnecessary or not of value. Amen. They are all needful in their Places. I want you to notice this text, brothers and sisters. He says that there should be no schism, verse number 25, in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for the other. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. It means we ought to take care for each other as if they were all in an equal degree of honor. Yes, sir. We ought to be concerned about building and edifying the body of Christ, not trying to have power plays and jealousy and envy and battles within the body. He says that we ought, to, we ought to have the same care regardless of training or tenure or talent because this is the church that Christ is trying to build. I'll tell you, but I want to challenge you, and I don't know what's going on with you or not going on with you, but I know church. Right. I don't know what's going on. Nobody has had nobody has coached me, but I know, I know, I know church. Yes, sir. Right. And I know that often we're God is trying to go one way, and we're trying to go another way. Right. That sometimes we're building based on our own ideas of what the church is about. Yes, sir. Sometimes we have a hodgepodge or mixture of tradition or ideas from people within our own circles of association. We may have ideas from previous church experience or our feelings or our thoughts. The problem is that many of these ideas may be out of line with God's work and the church that Christ is trying to build. Oh yeah, he's going to build his church. Yeah. But we can momentarily frustrate what he's trying to do with his church. 
Oh, he's going to build his church because the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a blessed assurance, and that is blessed insurance. Oh, he's going to build his church. Amen. And no devil in hell is going to stop God Amen. from doing what he wants to do. Amen. God is going to build his church. But I challenge you, brothers and sisters, to walk in line with the church that Christ is trying to build. My Lord. I challenge you to get in step with the will of the Holy Spirit as he's trying to put us all in place in relationship with each other. That we get right with God and we get right with each other so that we can be a part of the church that Christ is trying to build. Because ultimately, he wants to bring glory to his own name. I'm going to say this and sit down. God is only ultimately concerned about one thing. That's his glory and not yours. He's going to glorify his own name. That's why he's about building that church that only he can build. I'll tell you, I pray that the blessings of the Lord will be on you for another 120 years of Christ shall tarry. And in the time in between, I pray that every member of this church will be people who have been born again, who's been placed by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And yet every member will be in conformity with his will as he's trying to help you to be. The church that he's building. In Jesus' name.